Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending where, where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you a new installment of E4C's Development, Development Engineering Career Insights, focusing on reflections on the profession, careers in impact design. My name is Mariela Machado, and I am Program Manager here at Engineering for Change. I will be the host today, and your moderator will be joining, will be joining us from Autodesk Foundation. The webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming webinars is available on our webinars page. If you see members, will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenter, I would like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change, E4C. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. If we see membership is free and provide access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as job, jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. If we see members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with your, the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve your resources aligned to your interests. So please uh, visit our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. Today's webinar is one of, our, one of six webinars in E4C's Development Engineering Career Insights Series. Additional topics covered in this series are listed on this slide. We invite you to check out the recorded webinars for additional career insights. Okay, so before we move on, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, if you see right below, below your screen, you will see a chat window, which you can always, um, you can always click on and type uh, your questions, concerns, or if you have, you're having any te technical difficulty, you can chat and send a private message to Engineer for Change admin. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window. Be sure that you type your Q&A uh, your Q and A in this window instead of the chat, so that we will read your question, and your presenters and moderators will be able to to see it and answer them. If you don't see it, please click the Q and A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides as well. If you're listening to the audio broad broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. But again, if you're having any technical difficulties, please contact us directly through the chat window. If you see webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour, to request your PDH, please follow the instructions at the top of if you see professional development page after the presentation at the link shown on the slide. A special note about today's webinar. webinar. We will stop, you will stop 15 minutes before the hour to answer any questions you might have so that we can answer the Q&A. 
So without further, further to say, I would like to talk a little about our moderator today. Today, uh, our moderator is Bobby Casey. Bobby Casey is Autodesk Foundation's engagement coordinator responsible for driving successful partner relationships with foundation customers and grantees. She also manages the company's impact res residency program focused on driving adoption of Autodesk tools and workflows for greater impact and works to create a culture of impact with students globally via the Autodesk Foundation Impact Internship Program. She has spent 10 years at Autodesk and is uniquely positioned to connect innovators and entrepreneurs with value-add services from pro bono employee support to securing marketing and promotional opportunities. Before joining Autodesk, she worked in various industries including construction, mining, technology, and health. Bobby holds a Bachelor in Science degree in Strategic Management from Dominican University. Without further to say, I want to introduce your moderators for today, Bobby Casey. Bobby, over to you. Thank you. So I'm going to forward the slide. Great. My name is Bobby Casey, and I am an engagement coordinator for the Autodesk Foundation. This is the charitable arm of Autodesk. I think I have one of the best jobs in the world. Before I tell you why, let me provide a little background on the Autodesk Foundation. The Autodesk Foundation was created about five years ago in 2014 with the mission of supporting the design and creation of innovative solutions to the world's most pressing challenges. We invest in organizations and startups who are meeting the needs of a growing population while living within the means of the planet. In 2018, we decided to focus our foundation efforts in these three areas. One, low carbon innovation, supporting organizations creating low carbon refrigeration, solar lighting, cook stoves, etc. Two, healthy and resilient communities, assisting with refugee housing design, helping cities adapt to sea level rise, and preparing the planet for a warmer climate. And three, workforce development, making investments in the future of work and reskilling employees for jobs in automation. And how do we do this? So the foundation plays the role of an incubator or accelerator by providing services and support to help our portfolio organizations deliver impact. We have a unique value proposition in the world of philanthropy, and we are increasingly sought after as a partner, largely because of the types of support we provide. This support falls into three categories, investment, technology, and talent. We invest financial capital in nonprofits, social enterprises, and startups. We offer technology services like software donations, customized technical trainings, and a residency program at Autodesk Technology Centers located in San Francisco, Boston, and Toronto. For talent, we have over 9,000 Autodesk employees, and they love to volunteer on impactful projects. We also provide funding for nonprofits to host university students experienced with Autodesk tools for impact internships. These interns provide design support to increase technical capacity in these organizations. We believe that the unique combination of these resources help them to have greater impact. So my job is to offer these types of services to the organizations in the foundation portfolio. I believe I have the greatest job in the world because I get to support impactful organizations who are scaling their projects, programs to serve more beneficiaries. And now we get to hear from two amazing organizations who receive this type of support from the Autodesk Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Robert Frenny, an architect at Build Health International, and Adam Hornipiski, a product designer at Catapult Design. I've asked them each to talk a bit about themselves and their organizations, and I'll pass it over to Robert to share first. Thank you, Bobby, um, and thank you to the Autodesk Foundation. We've been partnered with the Autodesk Foundation for um, 
two or three years now, and they've had a tremendous impact from intellectual capital to um, to providing us with the software that we actually do all of our work in and, and training as well. So it has an enormous impact on what we do. So thank you very much to the Autodesk Foundation. Um, just a quick word about myself because I was asked to speak about myself. Um, I'm a licensed architect. I, I worked for a number of years at a large um, architecture firm in the Boston, Massachusetts area, working primarily on large healthcare facilities. Um, during my time at Shepley Bullfinch, I started to work with Built Health International really, you know, at night, on the weekends, um, you know, while getting frowns from my wife. Um, really developing some designs for some of the projects they were working on, uh, some of the healthcare infrastructure in, in Haiti, some of the educational work in Haiti, um, and some of the some of the work um, during the Ebola crisis in, in West Africa. So shortly after doing all of this work, I actually transitioned into Built Health International to to work with them to develop a an architectural team and and be the director of architecture to really plug into what Built Health International already was. So to give you a high level understanding of, of Built Health International, we are a group of architects, designers, engineers, construction professionals, uh, medical professionals, and procurement officers. But our, our goal and our vision is to really develop high quality healthcare infrastructure in impoverished regions of the world to improve access to high quality healthcare for those who otherwise would not receive it. So on the screen is the four general principles through which we work through all of our projects. And I'm gonna go through each of these in a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides. First off, design. In design, when you're working in a, um, in, in a low to middle income country is really all about sustainable planning. How do you develop a building that is fully adaptable into the future and, and fully resilient so that it lasts as long as it possibly can into the future? Um, you know, you really have to understand the context and constraints to make to make these things happen. And, and collaborative design is everything. Um, pulling the picture on the back of this slide is, is a, a photo of the a community gathering that we had for a hospital and community master plan where we pulled everybody together. We let them know what what the general idea was and we got all of their inputs and we'd have a series with all of our projects. We have a series of meetings where we're pulling the community together and getting their feedback because if this project is going to be successful. It's it's going, it needs to be their project. They need to own it. They need to take control of it once once we work through it and really operate it. And lastly, dignification. You know, every every healthcare facility or educational facility that we design and build in these environments, we want the people that use them to walk into these spaces and, and know that they're in the right space to get the highest quality healthcare or education that they could possibly get. So really providing dig dignification through our design. Implementation, you know, design itself is really not enough. In these environments, you have to figure out how you implement these projects. Um, so we have a team of construction professionals um, and we work with the locals. We're basically in Haiti, um, you know, in the background of this photo is the Maribale Hospital, which is still the largest healthcare facility in Haiti and provides free healthcare to, you know, around 250,000 Haitians who would otherwise not have access to healthcare. So what we do is we we come in and we partner with an organization that already has uh, stakeholders developed in the community. Um, we use local labor, we use local material, and what we're doing is we're basically managing the construction um, because at this point there just there isn't um, there isn't that skill yet developed in some areas of rural Haiti. And in doing this, we're not just providing uh, you know the end product of a facility that would have otherwise not been there. We're also training large groups of, of skilled laborers that can then go out and start their own business, businesses in construction and start to develop a higher standard of construction for the entire area. But again, you know, designing it's not enough and implementing is not enough either. We, we had designed this 
and and built a series of healthcare facilities in Haiti. Um, and, you know, we're always going back to keep an eye on them to see how they're operating. And we started to see that, you know, even though we designed them and built them to be as resilient as they could possibly be in the environment, a lot of, a lot of them were starting to break down and really go through tough times. So, so we saw that and we started to develop a maintenance program. And this is really uh, a group, a group of us, what, at least one of us on the ground for probably the first couple of years of each healthcare facility, developing a team of locals that can start to maintain the systems of the hospital so that they can, they can last into the distance future and, and the local people can actually take control. And lastly, we're evaluating all of our projects. And this was another um, uh, Autodesk grant. They gave us uh, two interns for a period of three months. Um, so what we did is we, we went down to Haiti with them and we looked at a series of our projects, also one of the projects in Malawi. Um, and we looked at you know, some of the decisions we made through design, some of the passive airflow and, and natural daylighting uh, decisions that we made that that we thought would improve the overall design of these buildings and make them more resilient. Um, so we went down and we tested all of them and we we came up with a report of how well all these passive design decisions actually worked in the field and a, a series of lessons learned that we can then implement on the next project to make the next projects more successful. So just a quick um, introduction of one of the projects that we finished um, about five or six months ago now in Haiti. This is the Center for Infectious Disease and Emergency Care, which is in Fond des Blancs, which is in uh, southern rural Haiti, about four hours south of the capital Port-au-Prince. Um, and this facility, now that it's fully operational, is seeing you know, around uh, 25,000 or more patients uh, on an annual basis. So one thing to keep in mind as we're working through these projects is the energy costs in a lot of these areas that we work in, specifically in Haiti, uh, is six times the cost of what we're spending in the United States. So we try to implement things like uh, renewable, renewable energy sources like the solar panels you see here. Um, but it's extremely important to cut the energy costs as low as possible in, in the design um, to make sure these these buildings last as long as they can and are able to see as many patients as they can. So in the United States, the average healthcare facility uses around nine watts per square foot per hour. Uh, for this specific building, we're aiming for two watts per square foot per hour, but but using this, the new softwares that we had and the passive systems that we've developed, now that we've actually gone back and measured this facility after it's been open for six months, we found that it's actually only using 0.75 watts per square foot per hour. And what that means is that that's money that can go back to the operations of the hospital. And that's money that they're not going to spend on energy, but that they can use to see, you know, 100, 100 more patients a month or, or something in that realm. So we do, we do this by using Autodesk Insight. We put the models into Autodesk Insight at a very early stage to understand um, you know, what the wall to window ratio, the ideal window to wall ratio would be, um, how we develop uh, you know, sloped roofs and the orientation of the building to be as efficient as we possibly can. And this is uh, just a photo of this specific building during construction. And I'm not going to get into the challenges of it right now, but um, this is just an example of you know, the concrete pour for the roof. You know, we, we had probably 30 people on site that day, but it's not like it is in the United States. We have to mix the concrete on the ground, and then we use an excavator to lift the concrete up to the roof where, where these laborers are, have their wheelbarrows, and they're wheeling it all the way over to the roof, and then there's guys with hand trowels actually troweling the concrete in place. So, there's a lot of challenges that we've had to work through and, and learn from, quite frankly, and, and you know we're still learning. And again, this is this is the facility that we completed, um, and has been fully operational for the last uh, five months. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Adam, um, and he's going to talk about his work with um, Catapult Design. Thank you all. All right, thanks, Rob. Um, and thank you, E4C and Autodesk Foundation. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is Adam Horbinski. I'm a product designer with Catapult. 
Um, and just a little background on how I got into impact design. Um, I kind of took a nonlinear path, which I found out is actually more common um, than I initially thought before getting into this field. Uh, so my background was in sociology. I was really interested in how technology affects groups of people and um, kind of behavior change around uh, introducing new technologies. Uh, after graduating, I worked with nonprofits and did a fair amount of volunteering as well. Um, worked in areas around homelessness and food security, uh, disability resources. Um, and then I kind of decided I was going to maybe try to um, professionalize that a little bit more and started a master's program in nonprofit management. Um, I found that I just felt too disconnected from the people that I wanted to help, and I wanted to be more kind of um, in the trenches. And so that's when I, I left the program and discovered product design. Um, and this really was the, for me, it was the perfect mix uh, between, you know, understanding user needs and kind of that research component, but then also designing solutions to their problems um, and taking action on that. Um, so that's a little bit about how I got where I'm at. I'm, I started uh, working in impact design in 2014 um, and started with Catapult about a year ago. So I will, if I can uh, walk you through these slides here. Um, all right, so yeah, so I started with Catapult about a year ago um, and Catapult is a, a design consultancy so we work with socially driven clients, um, usually around, uh, our clients usually work in you know, food security, health, uh, clean energy, sanitation, um, anything that has some sort of uh, kind of social benefit. We are registered 501c3 ourselves, and this helps us obtain funding for clients um, otherwise that, you know, that would otherwise have limited access to design services, which is really important for the people that we work with. Um, so our main office is located in Denver, um, but we have a, a, we're actually a relatively small core team um, with a, kind of a global network of design and engineers that we can tap into. Um, part of the, the, some of the skills that we have in that network are, you know, we have solar specialists, we have mechanical engineers, IP lawyers, researchers, and this really helps us recruit highly specialized teams uh, based on the client and project needs. Um, when we take on new projects. So we work with both for-profit and nonprofit organizations, um, ranging everywhere from you know, one to two person startup to a large organization, NGO, or foundation. Um, and basically the services we offer can kind of be categorized in, into three main categories, uh, product design and design consultation, training and mentorship, field research and strategy. So product design is uh, probably our most common service that we offer. Um, you know, we work with companies to design and develop products for market. Um, sometimes a client will come to us with a problem and a proposed solution, but they need help exploring concepts and, and building prototypes. Other times we'll have a, a client come to us with a, a prototype already built, and they're looking to kind of help validate their solution, um, scale up, or run kind of a pilot study. So we work with clients in all stages of, of design. Uh, the one thing that is uh, pretty specific to us as a design consultancy, however, is uh, we're always curious about user needs. And no matter where we start in a project, we always go back to try to understand who's the user, what are the use cases, what is the context, what is the environment this product will be used in, I mean, that really helps inform kind of all stages of design, even up into design for manufacture or implementation. Uh, the next service that we offer is uh, training and workshops. So this is usually more pertinent when an organization comes and wants to build capacity within their own organization around design and design thinking. So Catapult will help facilitate multi-day workshops or lead training sessions. Um, and at times we'll even leverage our own experience in the field to kind of design custom curriculum around projects in energy, water, health. Um, the last kind of main service that we, we provide is research, research and strategic planning. Um, this has to do more with when an organization 
um, or a company knows they have a problem, um, it's, a, it's kind of an undefined, complex problem, or they, do, or they see an opportunity and they don't know how to, what steps they should take. So we can kind of help come in and, and deconstruct the abstract. Um, we, can, we can bring in stakeholders, identify key players, both internally and externally, and kind of host brainstorming sessions and facilitate these discussions to really dial in um, you know, what the problem is and what the potential solutions are. And this can be really helpful uh, for organizations to move quickly and confidently uh, in developing technologies that they can then monetize in the future. So like I said, I started with Catapult about a year ago and really my role coming onto Catapult was um, to help organize and facilitate uh, design and engineering reviews. So this is a partnership that Catapult has with ASME and uh, originally it started with the iShow, now it's somewhat expanded. Um, we facilitate two-day DENRs in India, Kenya, and the U.S. with about eight to ten different startups, and they're all they're all in the impact design space. Um, so what Catapult does is we will you know help filter through the applicants. It's it is somewhat of a competition. We'll filter the applicants and um, help identify experts and kind of holes in the the company's business plan or product or kind of gaps where, you know, they might need extra advice on. Um, so we'll identify the experts and then we'll bring them on site. And over the course of two days, we'll go through uh, kind of four key areas. We'll touch upon customer insight, hardware validation, manufacturing, and implementation. Um, and this really provides a lot of value to these companies because they have a room full of experts that are very knowledgeable about their specific product. Um, and they're also building connections outside of their own organization that will help them kind of further their development. Uh, Catapult then works with uh, these companies and based on their expert reviews, uh, we will define kind of contained projects um, that we can work on together collaboratively and kind of push them to that next stage. So this has been really fun for me. I love working with startups. Um, I love the culture. I love kind of the vibrancy of it. Um, the number of different types of products I get to work on and the, you know, among so many different industries, um, it really is an exciting space. Uh, so to kind of sum up the value proposition that we have for our clients, um, you know, our main, our main offering is really our, our um, capacity for innovation. But we can only achieve that through the global network that we have with, with all these experienced resources um, and our ability to align our mission with that of our client. Um, so us being a nonprofit is, I think, very important to the work we do. Um, and also just the transparency that we, we like to have in our process with the client it offers them some of a, a, mentoring, um, a mentoring process as well. So this is just a little bit about what Catapult does, um, and also more specifically about what I, my relationship and what I do, the role that I play with Catapult. Um, so now I'm going to hand this back over to Bobby, and thank you. Great. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Robert. It was great hearing more about you and your organizations. So now is the time for some questions. So I think we've got quite a bit of time, which um, love to dive in a little bit. Um, so I think this question is for both of you. Maybe I'll start with uh, Adam first. What do you wish you had known when you started your career in impact design? Okay, thanks Bobby. Um, so I think one of the things that I wish I had known um, starting off in, in impact design is really how much cost is a factor to what we do. Uh, I think, you know, before you actually get into the profession, um, design is a little bit more nebulous and it's, you know, about the user experience and, and it's about, um, you know, kind of the fun factor, at least in school. Um, when you get into especially impact design, it really cost is a huge factor. And, um, you know, even a couple of pennies, shaving a couple of pennies off of the manufacturing cost or um, assembly can make or break a product. And so I think 
understanding that and understanding how to design for that um, in the initial stages will really help you become a more successful designer engineer um, in this field. Great, thank you. And Robert, do you have any um, thoughts on this one? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I would say the thing I, I sort of wish I had understood a little bit more is just the challenge of it all, really. Um, I think when you look at impact design, a lot of a lot of people do a really good job of showing you the positives of the process and and the numbers that come out of it and the impact that it has. Um, but to get into impact design, you, you really have to adjust the way that you're living. You know, you, you, you really have to be mission driven, mission driven. You have to want to help people and sort of, um, you know, figure out a way to change the way that you were living before. Um, as an example, you know, I, I, when I transitioned over to BHI into the nonprofit world, I, you know, I took a large pay cut and I, me and my family decided that that was the right move. You know, I went on Craigslist in my first week here and I bought this awful bike for $50 that I'm, you know, still riding into work when it's 20 degrees. Um, but, you know, I'm taking cuts in my own life so that we can provide you know, our, our services to everybody that we want to reach out to that's in, impoverished throughout the world at a lower cost. But, you know, in, in the end, if, if you're willing to, to take these, these challenges head on and, and really focus on your, your mission and your goals, it really is better. You may, you may have less um, money, but, you know, your, your children my my children sort of grow up with a better reference of of what is happening in the world, um, and hopefully it develop you develop some more values that go beyond capitalism. I took my I took my son down to Haiti um, back in May, um, and you know it, it's 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 been amazing to see it was amazing to see what his thoughts were when he was down there because it was completely different from what he was used to. But now that we've been back for four or five months, um, you know, everything is sort of Haiti focused for him. He two months ago, he he set up this little uh, lemonade stand and I wasn't sure what he was doing, but he, he did pretty well. And he said after he was done that he wanted to donate all his money to Haiti. So it, it really does change not just you, but your your family. And you should you should really understand what that impact could be before you get into it. Well, thanks, Robert. That's a beautiful story. I love that lemonade stand idea. Um, so another question that um, I thought would be great uh, to ask for people who might be considering a career in impact design, and Adam, it would be great to hear from you on this one. What setbacks have you encountered in your career and how did you overcome them? Yeah, so um, yeah, I think you know everyone has setbacks along their journey. Um, one, of, one of my first uh, real notable setbacks was um, with my first job right out of school. Um, so many years ago, I thought I landed my dream job. It was in impact design, felt very lucky. Um, I was moving down to San Francisco and um, was a design engineer working with a solar company and we're um, developing new product and prototyping and testing in the field. And um, it was just, I loved it. Um, and about eight months in, the company uh, realized that they were kind of overstretching themselves. And uh, the board decided to kind of reorganize and refocus um, to kind of stop the gap, stop the, the money from flowing. Um, and so my entire department was laid off. And I was very disillusioned. Um, one, I think, you know, when you're first starting your career, getting laid off, it's difficult to understand um, being your first job and everything. Um, but it was a great lesson, honestly. And uh, I think one thing that it really kind of kind of speaking to Rob's point, one thing with impact design that should be noted is that it's not. It, it can be an unstable in, unstable industry. Um, it's it can be difficult, and money's tight, and resources are are limited, and um, that's just part of the job. And so, 
under, understanding that is good getting into it. Um, what this experience also taught me, however, was the importance of maintaining and managing costs from a business perspective. Um, you know, it's important for your customers, but it's also important for your employees. And um, this is something, this lesson is something that I apply to my work now. So when I'm working with startups, I intimately understand how cost is going to affect their success. Um, and so, you know, kind of speaking of what I, I said earlier, um, this is something that I try to apply in my day-to-day -day work and really, really focus on how do we make this more affordable so it can be more accessible. Um, and then I think the, the other thing to note is that, you know, I was able to bounce back from that experience because of all of the connections I made in, the, in that industry. And this is impact design. I am constantly amazed at how small um, this, this field is. I mean, everyone knows everyone. So, you know, if you're looking to get into impact design, it's really important to meet people and, you know, try to get your foot in the door volunteering or going to talks or whatever, because those connections is, that's what's going to help you kind of move forward and, and get your first job or help, help the work that you do. Great. Thanks so much. And uh, another question I had, and perhaps Robert, you could address this one. I think you talked about it a bit in your presentation about your work with Build Health, but how has technology helped you to deliver impact? Yeah, um, it's it's really increased our efficiency. Um, you know, as Adam said, we're constantly trying to figure out how to cut our costs and be more efficient so that we can give more to the client for less. Um, and technology has played a huge role in that. So throughout the design process, we're using um, Autodesk softwares, as I said before, um, to really look at at how we can make these buildings as efficient as we possibly can. But, um, you know, and, and that, that lowers the operational cost for the facilities in the long term. But we're also able to use technology to, to do more accurate takeoffs of the materials so that we can get um, more accurate on our construction costs and the client can really know what they're getting into. Um, and we're also, you know, it's it's a challenge working from Boston, but but really doing work, um, you know, all, all over Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, and Haiti, and having teams all over the world um, and, and making sure that you connect back with them because our, you know, our, our core of architects and engineers are really in, in Massachusetts um, and, and everybody else is sort of in the field. So technology has enabled us to, to figure out ways to connect um, and, and to, to, to be in better communication, to to relay information as efficient as possible, and and really to learn. Um, you know, it's it's a constant learning process. We we've figured out a lot in the last eight years, but every day we're making mistakes. Um, and without technology, we may you know we may not learn from those mistakes, and we may repeat them over and over again. So, technology has has really increased our efficiency across the board. Great, thanks. And then I think uh, I'd love to hear from both of you on this uh, topic. Um, what are you most excited about in terms of the future or where do you see impact coming in the future or potentiality around that? So let's start with Adam. Yeah, so I think um, what, what I'm really excited about is seeing how greater access to um, manufacturing and prototyping tools affects design um, in in a lot of these rural areas. Um, it's I, I went and actually visited um, IKPE, which is the uh, incubator makerspace in Bangalore, um, and was just blown away by the resources that they were providing these startups, um, and and especially in uh, like medical technology. So you know they had high-end testing labs. They had um, just the resources and the knowledge. And um, I think that's going to be, that's going to have a huge impact on, on these different industries and, and what problems we can address. Um, so I think, you know, as far as technology is concerned, making those more accessible 
to more people um, will just will really you know push design forward. It will push problem thinking forward. It will get more people involved, um, and I think that's that's something a, a technological thing that we're that I'm excited about. Yeah, and I, I um I, I'm really just excited to see our growth in the future. Um, yeah, as I said a few times in this presentation, we make mistakes every day, um, and we learn from them, and we grow, and we become more efficient, and the product that we deliver becomes just a better product and more sustainable. Um, you know, we're working we're working on a lot of larger scale master plans for different hospitals and uh, community master plans that really, um, you know, will be implemented from today into the next five, 10, 20 years. So I think I'm, I'm really interested in watching the impact of some of the things that we've worked on, um, but really seeing how the community grows and how, how some of these things impact the community in positive ways. Um, not everything's going to be positive. You know, we want to see the negatives as well and, and learn from those. But, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see how many how many patients the healthcare um, institutions that we help develop see in the next, you know, four or five years. And I'm excited to see, to go down and, and, and spend some time at the schools that we've developed and see all the students and and sort of follow their progression through through their education and and really watch through the next 10 to 20 years and see where they end up. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited for growth and, and, and moving forward in the future. Thanks. I, uh, so if anyone's uh, listening in, if you can post any of your questions in the Q&A, um, so we'll have some time to answer your questions, um, either myself, Adam, or Robert. Uh, since we seem to still have some time, I was thinking uh, perhaps it'd be great to hear any advice that Robert and Adam have about how to get into the field, how, how to create a career in, in, uh, with impact. So I'll start with you, Adam, if you have any advice for students or people looking to make a career change or how to bring this into their company. Yeah, I think um, I would say the the best piece of advice that I could offer would be, um, and it sounds a little cliche, but really establish your network. Um, it's really important uh, that you, you know, go to presentations, uh, go and, you know, express interest in organizations that you're looking at. Um, people are happy to talk to you. And I think really it's, you know, like Rob said earlier, it's, you know, you have to you have to kind of buy in and, and show your passion for what you're doing um, and learn from people, you know? Um, I've learned a ton from the people I've worked with. Um, and it's really helped me grow, but also kind of carve my path and in, in understanding what I want to do, what I don't want to do, what I'm, uh, what I'm successful at, what I could be better at. Um, so I think really my piece of advice would just be talk to people, get involved, um, learn as much as you can, and, and opportunities will present themselves. And Robert? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, don't wait. Don't, don't wait to find your ideal job and impact design that, that you feel is going to have the largest impact. Just find something. Um, it doesn't have to be international. There's plenty of people that are struggling here in the United States that could, you know, use, really use the skills that you've been lucky enough to get through school or, or through other venues. So I, I would just say, get out there and do it. Um, you know, as an organization, we're always looking for talent, um, but there's plenty other nonprofit organizations that are, are, are doing impact work. So do some research, uh, reach out to these people, just have a conversation about what they're doing um, and see if they need any help because I, I can guarantee you, if, if you have the skills, um, they're probably not going to say no to receiving some level of help. Um, as, as far as, as making uh, sort of if you're comfortable in your organization and you want to figure out how to bring impact work into your organization, I would, um, I would just start the conversation. 
you know, start it, start it down low and, and bring it up high. You know, I think um, a lot of people get wrapped up in the work that they're doing day by day. But if, if you, if you can start to get your organization into this work, whether it be donating or providing, you know, the intellectual capital, it, it has a dramatic impact. Um, and I think it, I think everybody walks away from doing this work a little bit, you know, more exhausted at the end of the day, but a little bit, you know, more uh, uh, with the feeling of achievement. Um, and, and you can, you know, your companies can really market this. It's not something that you can use to generate a lot of income, but a lot of people are attracted to this work. And if you can show that your company is in some way making an impact, that could potentially attract a lot of other people, a lot of new partnerships to your existing work. So get out, get out there and just, and get started would be my input. Great. So I can share a little bit as well about Autodesk and opportunities that I know about. So at Autodesk currently, we have quite a few open uh, jobs. We have offices all over the world. Uh, the Autodesk mission is to help people imagine, design, and make a better world. So I'll put in the chat box right now the link so that people can go and see what types of jobs are available and perhaps apply there. Uh, another uh, way to get involved if you're a student is we do have a student program with Autodesk student experts. And so these are st university students who are using Autodesk tools. And as I mentioned earlier, we have an impact internship program that we will be putting out a call for proposal to our nonprofit organizations in January to fund some impact internships this uh, summer of, of 2019. So if any students out there are using Autodesk tools and would be interested in trying out a time with an uh, impact internship and learn more about how these organizations work, that would be great. Uh, many of the organizations that we hear from and that are in our Autodesk portfolio are actually hiring and they're looking for engineers and architects who want to work for an impact design company. So I've included in the chat box my LinkedIn profile, so please connect with me on LinkedIn. And you can also connect with me um, at bobby.casey at autodesk.com. So I've included that information in the chat box as well. So I think there are many opportunities to get involved either with a company like Autodesk or with an organization like Catapult Design and Build Health International. And I, my mission is to have more people doing impactful work in the world, and I invite you to join us. Great, Bobby. Thank you so much, and thank you so much uh, to Adam and Rob. This has been very insightful and very detailed. Um, I just want to highlight, Bobby, just for the people that are um, here in the recording, if you could spell out your your name and your email, and then maybe uh, the Autodesk slash careers, just so that sure. we read out you know what we put here in the chat for the people that are here in the recording. Great. So my email is Bobby dot Casey. So that's B O B B I E dot C A S E Y at Autodesk A U T O D E S K dot com. And then the website for Autodesk, uh, Autodesk Careers are www.autodesk.com slash careers. And as I mentioned, we have offices all over the world. So please take a look, use the search feature, find out what you're interested in. And uh, we have a referral program at Autodesk. So if you're interested in the position, ping me on LinkedIn, Bobby, B-O-B-B-I-E, Casey, C-A-S-E-Y and happy to talk with you more about those positions or, or refer you for a position at Autodesk. And if you're interested in working directly with a nonprofit organization or startup doing impact design, uh, let me know your interest there as well, and I will do my best to connect you with the organizations that are hiring. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Bobby, for that information. I'm sure a lot of our the people that are listening to this webinar are interested in these opportunities. If you guys uh, have any questions or you want to get in touch with Bobby, please also be sure to write us to uh, the email that you're seeing on the screen, so webinars at engineerforchange.org, and we'll be sure to connect you to Autodesk. Um, thank you so much for attending, everyone. If you want to obtain your PDA certificate, 
notification, please use the link that you're seeing on your screen as well. You can go to our website and visit Professional Development, and there's more information there on how to obtain the PDH. And please don't forget to become an E4C member and attend the next uh, webinar on this series. Okay, so before, uh, without further to say, I want to thank you, Bobby, Adam, and Rob, for this amazing webinar, and thanks so much, everyone, for attending. Bye bye. Thank you, Mario. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, guys.